All right, so today we're going to be working on an 820-2936 that has no green light in the charger. And also this board will not charge the battery, but it'll work just fine off a of battery. So I want to start off with, um, with uh, going over a couple of things. Now, when you look on this board, one of the first things you're going to notice is that it looks pretty clean. Um, so, you know, you look over the ISL area and, I mean, this does not look like something that was damaged by water in any way. So it's, you know, and you look over the other, you know, primary areas of the board and it looks pretty good. You go by the SMC. You know, it looks pretty good. There's this one cap over here that's kind of sticking up. There's probably some kind of physical damage from shipping or something, but you can see where the board trace over here is kind of messed up. But we're not going to touch that. That's not really crazy important. That's for the... Uh, 1v05 power rail, which obviously works if the machine turns on and works. So again, if it works, don't fuck with it. So if we measure a little bit around here, again, one of the first things I say that is important is checking current sensing circuitry. So let me just show you what that looks like on a schematic. So over here, I've explained what current sensing is in many other videos. I'm not going to go on to explain what that is here. But these two resistors are of interest to me, R7021 and R7022. So the charger is going to be going through this resistor, and there's going to be a voltage drop across that resistor. The voltage drop across that resistor is going to be dependent on how much power the machine is using. So that gets reported to the ISL from the beginning of this resistor and the end of this resistor, but it goes to these two 10-ohm resistors. So let's see on my board what those look like. And... So they look good. And unfortunately, because of where my multimeter is positioned, you can't see it. What I'm going to do is I'm going to measure right over here and see what I have. So one of these resistors over here is 549 kilo ohms instead of 10. And the bottom resistor is infinite. So that's infinite ohms, uh, open load, open line, whatever you want to call it, whatever the <coughs> OL means on a fluke multimeter. And that's no good. So... So first things first, let's get rid of those two resistors that don't work the way they're supposed to. Now, it's going to take forever for my hot air station to heat up. I understand that. I, I don't expect anything else from the junky heating element that I spent $98 on with next day shipping. That is, that is a loss. But what I'm going to do, just to make it easier to get this off, is create a solder blob there. And kind of try to get the stuff to leave the board. Come on. Yeah. I should probably just wait for the hot air station to get hot, but I don't have patience for the 20 minutes this shit is going to take. And then it's just going to turn itself off. That's, that's the thing. So this, this Hacko FR801, it used to turn itself off if I had the heat higher than 6.5 and, and the air lower than 10. That was annoying, but that was something I could live with. This thing, this, this thing now, it turns itself off if the heat is higher than 10 and the air is lower than 20, which makes it virtually worthless for long-term use. That's not the kind of shit that you want from a $650 hot air station. But I have really bad luck with tools. Anybody that I've worked with will tell you that my luck with tools is awful. It's, it's legendary how bad my luck is with almost anything, actually. But, yeah, so... Yeah, I just get some solder in there. Some nice, fresh flux and clean out all the old shit. And let's take two resistors and let's see what we get. Now, current sensing has a lot of good uses. So this is on the charger side, so this is a little different. But let's say that uh, on the, well, what would it do on the battery side? So you know when your computer says that you have four hours left on the battery? It says you have four hours left on the battery. And then you open up a video editor or a video game or a high-definition movie or you, 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 know, you run Prime 95, and now it says that you have 30 minutes left in the battery. Well, how does the computer know that just because you're doing something that you have less battery life? Well, the current sensing circuitry is sensing how much amperage the computer is using. And if it senses that you're using more amperage than you were before, it knows that you're going to have less time. So the time calculation is actually based on the current sensing circuit. And it's also there for safety reasons. Uh, if it thinks that it's drawing 10 amps from a charger that's supposed to be delivering 5 amps, it's going to turn the charger off to protect the machine. Same from the battery. If there's any type of fault condition like that, 
it doesn't want you to burn your balls off on the computer. It's going to turn itself off so that you don't wind up burning your balls off on the computer and then suing Apple when you know, things go really bad. All right, so we replace that, and we still have low voltage. No bueno. Next up is simply replacing the ISL. So if anything happened to destroy those two resistors, I'm kind of, I'm very, very skeptical that my ISL is still good. Even though it looks kind of good. Yeah, but I have a limited time to get this done before my hot air station decides to turn off for no reason. Beep. Always wait for the iron to beep. Even I...
I really can't aim the solder for shit. Come on, go there. You can see now, I, I don't have to measure to see that I have a 12 volt rail because the fan is spinning. So the first issue with this was the issue with current sensing. So the current sense resistors were completely blown. After I replaced them, I actually went from having 3.4 volts on my PP bus G3 hot rail to having 1.7. I replaced the ISL and I had zero volts because I had not properly soldered it. So one of the things you probably saw was that some of the pins were not soldered there properly on the other end even though I thought I did it right with the hot air. I actually couldn't see it because there was too much flux and too much junk there. So one of the things that helps if you're really, really bad at soldering, because I'm particularly bad at soldering and I'm very bad at when it comes to like, just aligning small things and putting, you know, uh, like, like a, let's say, um, small flex cables and bending them and putting them in or having a wire go perfectly straight, any of that stuff I'm really bad at. If you have an iron with the really, really small tip, so I have a 2027, which is pretty big, but I have one of these real, I got the smallest bent tip that I could find for it. And they, you don't have to ask me for the model because I'm going to forget, but they have these on Hacko's website. Uh, you can get a tip that bends at, it bends at the end, and it's really, really small, and it allows you to get in and actually feel each one of the connections. So as you're moving it back and forth, unlike a regular tip where you're not going to feel each individual alcove, you're going to be able to feel each individual pad. You're going to feel a little bit of feedback as you move back and forth. And with experience, you'll know how to do that without banging the board and ripping everything off of it, but rather banging kind of, kind of along the side of the chip so that you can get everything soldered. Again, I am not a great solderer, and if you don't know uh, how to do that properly, like, again, it's kind of sad, after damn near six years, I don't even know how to do it properly, uh, you'll, you'll notice that you have a lot of problems related to that chip that are not actually chip problems, they're not board problems, they're simply problems, problems in soldering. <laughs> <clears throat> Still sick. And that's about that. So that's, you know, that's a basic current sensing problem, a basic ISL problem. It was clearly not soldered. It clearly wasn't resting flat in the board. And you can see how I wound up fixing it again. I hot aired it. I pushed it down, not too hard, just I wanted to make sure it was down on the board very, very clearly. And then I went through each of the pins and I went brum, brum, brum. And I actually wanted to feel the feedback from my iron as I moved back and forth, feel the feedback from it so that I knew that it was soldered. So this is a great technique. If you completely suck at soldering as badly as I do, if you are god-awful at soldering the same way I am. Again, if you come to the class that we're teaching, uh, Jessa will be handling all of the soldering, all of the teaching you how to solder, how to use a hot air station, how to put micro jumpers in the board. I will be showing you what to do. I will be showing you how to think. I'm going to be showing you how to solve a lot of these board level problems, but I am not going to be the one teaching soldering. I, I, I should not. Again, I, in the, the, reason, the real important reason that I'm not editing out of these videos, the reason that I don't want to edit out any of the soldering or any of the mistakes, is because you're going to make a lot of these mistakes along the way. And one of the things you need to learn, it's not just how to uh, figure out the problems, you also need to learn what not to do, uh, what to do when you screw up. Because like, being successful is not really about uh, doing the right thing, it's about knowing how to avoid doing the wrong thing. So the more I show you the wrong things to do, the more you know how to avoid it, and the better off you'll be. So that's pretty much that. We have a working board, and hopefully you learned something.